Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents as its special guest Bill Lashmet, bargaining coordinator for the National Farmers Organization, and Gene Potter, director of the NFO Meat Commodity Department, who is a graduate of the University of Illinois in Agricultural Economics. Here now for U.S. Farm Report is Bill Lashmet. Gene, there are several things that I think that we need to discuss here for the benefit of the people. Number one, I think the important thing is that collective bargaining is caught on certainly all over the country with most all farmers. I would like to uh, refer to the article or the survey that was run by Farm Journal in which they, in their survey, uh, stated that 70% uh, of all farmers thought that collective bargaining and holding actions were essential and were all right. Something else that I thought that was real interesting in that particular survey is that 92% of the NFO members thought that holding actions were a must, 40% of the Farm Bureau members thought that it was a must, and only 28% uh, of the Farm Bureau members thought that it was wrong. So certainly the idea of holding actions and collective bargaining is being more and more accepted by farmers in general. I think there are several things that has brought this on. One is, of course, the, that farmers absolutely cannot continue to exist on the present price structure that we have. Uh, prices are too low for what we produce, what we have to sell, compared with what they were 10 years ago, and the things, of course, that we have to buy are so much higher than they were 10 years ago. So this uh, uh, combination of things has, has brought this about, and certainly no one else is making the fight for the farmer or doing exactly what NFO is trying to do, and this is working on a price. As all farmers know that uh, everything that farmers have to buy, as I said a while ago, has gone up, and our, pr our problem is price. It's nothing else. We can buy the things that we have to buy, whether it be gasoline, feed, implements, from several sources, or insurance, or, or several sources, and the prices that we have to pay varies very little from one company to the other. So our, our problem has to come back and be nothing more than the price that farmers receive for the products that they must sell. So uh, we just came into a holding action here, and I'd like to take a few minutes, if I could, and explain to the people our structure that we established in going into this holding action, because I think that very few people really understand the, the scope of our organization, and the network, and the communication system that we have. I think we have a communication system that is as good or better than anybody else in the country, regardless of what particular group that it may be. We are now organized in, in 40 states, and or 41 states it is, and in these 41 states we have the 41 states divided off into 37 marketing areas. And I would like to draw this structure out here. Now keep in mind that a marketing area is made up of between 32 and 50 counties. It depends on the location and the area of the country in which it's in. Now, in the Midwest, in the heavy producing states of Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, Missouri, eastern Ca Nebraska and Kansas, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin. These areas we have it down to, in most cases, our marketing areas contain in the neighborhood of 35 counties. So we, and when we divided these, we divided these into seven areas, and over each of these marketing areas, we put what we call a marketing area chief. So I'm going to put him here. This is our marketing area chief. Okay. 
Now, keep in mind, this is one marketing area. There are 37 of these marketing area chiefs in our NFO collective bargaining structure. Under the marketing area chief, and I keep in mind, I said there was an average of 35 counties. Under this, we have these marketing areas divided into seven equal geographic areas. Now, of course, the ideal situation would be if we had uh, five counties in each zone. These are called our zones, the, the geographic areas that we have the marketing area divided into. Now, each zone will ideal, of course, would be five counties, but in some cases it might be four counties. In some cases it might be six. And these we call our zone coordinators. There are seven of those in each of the marketing areas. And this takes us down, as I said, there are four to six counties in each of these particular zones. And bringing this on down into the counties. And we'll say here that we have five. Over each of these counties, or in each of these counties, we have what we call our super county bargaining structure. And in our super county bargaining structure, we have a bargaining supervisor over each of these counties. And now I'm going to transfer this on down here and, and show the actual county bargaining superstructure. Here we have a, a, the uh, bargaining supervisor. He has also an assistant. Under him, the county is divided into geographic areas again. We have asked that each county be divided into a minimum of four geographic areas, depending on the membership and the size of the county. But if a county, and we'll take the example here that there we have, we'll say five geographic areas in the county. Then in this, over each of these areas, we have what we call a bargaining coordinator, a BC, he's referred to. There are five BCs in this particular setup that we have here. Now keep in mind, I said there was a minimum of four. There could be as many as eight, depending on the size of the county and the membership in the county. Bargaining coordinator. Now under the bargaining coordinator, we have it broken down still further, right on down to the most minute part of the county and to the member. The bargaining coordinator has under him then for each eight members, or each eight members in the county, he has what he has called here a county marketing coordinator. County marketing coordinator. So let's say that this man here, he has eight of these here under the bargaining coordinator, and then this, bargaining, this marketing coordinator is responsible for eight members. And this is how the structure is laid out from the marketing area clear down to the each individual member in the county. Gene, I see that you're pointing at me here, and that's a good thing that you are, because I'm, I'm a little bit wrong here in what I'm calling this. Now, I'm, I'm going to come back up here and make this correction. It's a good thing that you were sitting there watching and, and being awake, more awake than I was. Uh, and I want to run through this whole thing again real quick. We've got the marketing area chief. We have the zone coordinators, the seven of them, for each of the counties in the zone. Five is an ideal situation. I said we had between four and six. Then we have our county structure coming on down where we have our county bargaining supervisor and his assistant. And then I call these, by mistake, uh, bargaining coordinators, and I should have called them section foremen. Actually, uh, these are section foremen. And uh, after we come from the section foreman, we come on down. And of course, the next step being then the bargaining coordinators. And the bargaining coordinators comes right on down to each member in the county. So this is our, our structure. And uh, I think it's a very good structure. It gives us communication system all the way from here. In other words, uh, let me explain how fast it really is. We can make a tape here at the National Office, right here in this very room, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And by 
4 o'clock in the evening, it can be what was on that or from meeting that evening in the counties, the tape can be played in every county over this whole area, the whole 1,500 counties in the 41 state area. Now, if I get this erased, then I would like to go on to the next step that we are, are talking about or we are going to be talking about. And I think the next step that we need to go into, Gene, or the next thing that we need to talk about is what everybody else was predicting and, and uh, as far as numbers were concerned. And uh, I would like to, to talk about uh, hogs and cattle both at this point. Uh, and, and I'm going back to last November when the processors and, and the government and everybody else were predicting that the hog numbers were going to hold fairly constant up to the, possibly the second week of December. And then the numbers would start tilling off and uh, there would be less slaughter then for the latter part of December, January, February, and March. But we saw this as something totally different than what the government. Now keep in mind that we go back and use this structure right here in determining the exact numbers of head of livestock or anything else that there is out here in the country. And uh, bar none, this is the best communication system and the best system for gathering information there is. Now I want to start out here and, and uh, just throw a little projection on the board here if I can. Now, uh, in coming out of, of December, what the government was more or less projecting was that uh, the numbers would possibly tail off a little bit here. We'd have a straight tailing off, and then in March we'd pick up a little bit, a very little, and then we would have another tailing off. Now, this is what the more or less the government uh, predictions were showing. Now, when we got ours, we saw something totally different. We saw this thing, uh, and keep in mind that this first line here is, is what the government was saying was going to happen. And here's what our members with the communication system and bringing this in that we saw was going to happen. We saw this thing coming off something like this into about the second week. It's a slight incline all the way up to the second week. And then we saw this thing starting to move up like this, a much sharper increase than, uh, and much earlier than what the government and coming on up, tapering off here, and then the second week of April, then we saw this thing starting to tail off and getting close to what they were saying out here, possibly by August. So uh, this is what we saw. Now, in the, uh, and I'm going back to when we called a holding action, which was right here at this particular period. In interior Iowa at that time, we had an 1850 market. Now, we forecast something in the neighborhood of a 15% increase. This was a very erratic increase. But we, we saw this coming uh, over what the government was projecting. That's this 15% here, more. And I know that I talked to myself to several processors, and I know that you were into some with me, in which uh, they kept saying, well, what's this market going to do? What's this market going to do? And I, I know that my standard answer to those people was, well, uh, it's going to depend what the market does is what NFO does. So what I'm saying here is what we did is that we maintained that at this peak, hogs would have gone to some place between 12 and $13. What we did is that we leveled this thing off. We took hogs off of the market to this point here, right here. So, well, maybe a little farther, about the second week of, of uh, of uh, April. Now, what we are in the process, or what we are in the process of doing, is taking this 15% increase off that we had here and spreading it out into the valley that was coming here and still maintaining the market. And this is, of course, what we've been doing up to this point. Now, today, I think here in Iowa that you'll see roughly an 1875 market. And we have moved one heck of a lot of hogs during this period of time, and we have proven that although you might have a big swell coming in numbers and you might have a big tapering off or a, a uh, belly coming into this thing, so to speak, 
But if you are selling, if you can hold off here and sell here and still maintain the market, I think that we have proven that this is one way that the market can be stabilized. This is what we have accomplished. Certainly, with the structure that we have and the economic situation that we have in agriculture today, we felt that farmers could not go through this and still maintain or have as many farmers left today to out here in the agriculture as we've got if this thing would have gone ahead and happened. So uh, this, can, this can be accomplished. Uh, and Gene, I'd like to ask you a, a question here. I've been doing all the talking up to this point. Uh, we've been into this holding action. Uh, just what have we accomplished at this point, in your opinion? Well, I think, Bill, uh, of course, one of the things that uh, has been done, you've been talking about here, but by no means is it the total objective of this organization to just try to affect supply over, a over the short run to improve the general price level. This certainly has to be part of it. But we saw a situation uh, prior to this, and Bill, I know that you were aware of it. We have been marketing and developed an elaborate marketing structure out here over a period of the last four years, uh, moving a tremendous volume of production and we're making some gains as far as the industry was concerned. But there was some hesitancy on the part of many people in the processing industry to uh, be progressive enough to make uh, steps forward that we felt that there were going to be a tremendous amount of farmers pushed off in the farm before the job could be accomplished. So uh, as far as leveling out the supply, of course, that was one objective. I think the most important objective was that of signing contracts with processors to stabilize the market price in the future. And we've said many times since the beginning of the holding action, of course, that uh, there have been contracts signed. We've announced the signing of contracts at various times, and we're still signing contracts. In fact, yesterday, uh, we got two contracts uh, in that were mailed in uh, just yesterday. So there is an effect from this standpoint. But I think one thing many people do not realize, that a contract that is signed with a uh, member of the industry, with a processor, although today, right at this minute, we don't have enough of those contracts to activate and stabilize the market. We do have a great number of them. And those are just like money in the bank, because those contracts are good, they can be activated tomorrow or they can be activated six months from now. They're good until enough of them are piled up, until we can activate them and stabilize the price in the future. So in the meantime then, it's a matter of using this block of production that has been grouped together, the members working together and not going in and saying, uh, I have 50 head of hogs to sell, what will you give me for them? but going in as a block, and I would like to use an example of that. If there are four farmers, each with 100 head of hogs, and there's a processor that kills 400 head of hogs, when I, as farmer number one, and you're number two, and there's two other farmers sitting over here, Bill, when uh, a processor X wants to buy 400 head of hogs, once he buys my 100, he needs your 100, and the other two farmers a great deal less. And then when he buys yours, he needs the two left a little bit less yet. And by the time he's bought that third farmer's hogs, he doesn't need the fourth man very bad at all. Yet, when all four of these farmers go in and say, we have 400 head of hogs, and move them together in a block, their bargaining power is terrifically increased. And that bargaining power is what we're using to stabilize the market now and move off the production that would have been here several months ago. Well, this is certainly right, correct, Gene, of what you're saying here, and it's, it's been very important, it is very important that, that uh, we continue and we get more contracts signed, and certainly we have a large number of contracts signed now. Uh, and also, uh, the thing that I was talking about a while ago, this has been very important, is to level out this production to maintain a stable price. But let me ask you this question. Why then would, should farmers uh, join NFO to market this way? Well, uh, I think that's a funny question for you to ask. I'm sure you've answered it many times yourself, Bill, but I know it is one that, that uh, enters a lot of people's minds because we're aware of the fact that any farmer in a heavy livestock producing area has no problem selling his production. Uh, there's plenty of people who want to buy it. And so the question then comes, why 
join an organization, make the effort uh, to do something different than you have in the past. Why exert this effort? Well, it costs something to market. Farmers have paid that cost before in low prices and erratic price levels. We paid the cost for marketing the way we did in 1955 with $10 hogs. We paid it again in 1959 with cheap hogs. We paid it in 1963 uh, uh, with uh, prime cattle, and I had them in Chicago at $18 a hundredweight. We've paid our cost to market before, and we took it off in the price. And NFO is asking its members to pay that cost of marketing in effort to get a higher price, to stabilize the supply, to block that production together, to sell it as a group so that packers can't use one farmer against another, but they go to the market as one block and having some bargaining power, not going to there and saying, what will you give me for what few head I have as an individual? Okay, fine. Uh, Gene, there's one other thing that I wanted to ask you, and that was we had a group of people in here today, uh, and they had to, to seem to have a problem uh, from an area not too far from the office here, but uh, would, you, would you explain this and why this particular problem developed? Well, Bill, it, uh, it was a problem, and I'm sure as far as these members and farmers are concerned, it's a real problem. But we have, uh, sitting in one area, it's hard to understand what happens. But from this standpoint, and when you put the whole area together, it's not too hard to see what happens at all. There is a major killer involved who today is paying a high price. Well, this killer was offered the block of production out of that particular area, and all that was asked was a decent market value for it. He was not willing to take it from the membership as a block, and so it was sold to another killer at the price the original killer had been asked. But the original killer, who was a major packer, then, although he didn't take the block of production, he's going out today and trying to buy from individuals at a higher price than he turned down for the whole block. This seems rather foolish, because here you say, well, he's paying more than what he would have had to pay, and that's true. But he's using that extra price, the other 25, 50 cents, 100 in some cases, in this particular instance, uh, to try to break up that block. It, again, is an example of the fact that the industry is afraid of this block of production. They're afraid of farmers working together. And they use a price to an individual trying to convince him that he shouldn't be a part of the overall block, that he should break off as an individual. And then the next step of the story is if he does break that block up, which we've seen it happen in, in uh, several years ago, this happened in a particular case, and he was successful in breaking the block up, and then the market went right back down in the area. But if the membership sticks together, all the, and this man will eventually quit doing this when he sees that he's not going to be able to break that block of production up. Okay, Gene, uh, do you see this over a big area happening today, or is, or is this just spotty, or what? Well, it certainly is spotty. In fact, in the majority of the heavy livestock producing area, uh, there isn't this type of problem at all. You find this type of problem when there are a limited number of buyers, and these buyers, uh, one of which is a one of the large major killers. So it, it is a spotty situation. And this is not the only place that there is, but it's a very small percentage of the total area. Okay. Well, Gene, uh, I think everything that you have said here is, is very true. And as we continue to analyze and look at the problems that agriculture has today, certainly from the economic situation, and we have been in contact with the with the banks and the local business people. We certainly know that the credit situation as far as agriculture is concerned is, is getting tighter and tighter. And uh, it comes right back to one thing, I think, as far as I'm concerned, and this is that farmers must get together. It's either get together, organize together, bargain together, and sell together, or we're certainly going to have less number of, of farmers. Now, the, the whole economic structure, as far as I'm concerned, is based on one thing, and this is 
doing away with, with more farmers. This is what they have in mind. They also have in mind of, of stabilizing the market, but stabilizing at a much lower figure than what farmers must have to produce the livestock or the grain or whatever it might be until they get it in fewer and fewer people's hands. And once that it is in fewer and fewer people's hands, then I will guarantee you that there will be something done as far as raising the price to the consumer. So this is a serious situation that we're in. Uh, Jean, uh, what advice could you give any of these non-members out here uh, as far as uh, join the organization? Uh, what should they do? Well, Bill, I think there's one thing. Many people have the idea. Well, I don't know for sure what I should do, so I won't do anything, and then I won't have an effect one way or the other. Farmers are going to make the choice, whether they act or whether they don't act. There's one of three things that are going to happen. The farmers are either going to fill this void in some type of collective bargaining organization, or the government uh, will do this through a socialized or nationalized agriculture, whatever you want to call it, has been done in many of the Western European countries. And this is an answer to the problem. If you consider it as such, uh, it would put agriculture on a sound basis. But I don't think myself or any of the rest of the farmers, or the majority of the farmers at least, want to be dictated to by the government. So it's a matter of uh, they're making a choice. It's a matter of which one they're going to do. They either act or they don't act. If they don't act, you're going to give government intervention or you're going to get corporate agriculture, vertical integration. Either one of them is not popular with farmers, and I know that most of them don't want it. So this leaves only one uh, uh, choice that we feel is feasible at all, and this is farmers working together to improve their position. So even if a, if a non-member or a man who hasn't joined the organization uh, is just waiting, he in fact has made a decision. He has decided to either let government take over agriculture or to be pushed out and let corporate agriculture come in. Well, I would agree with that 100%, Gene, and I think that, that uh, what it all boils down, the old slogan that we have always had that farmers must organize, they must do this job themselves, they must bargain together and sell together to end this whole problem in agriculture. U.S. Farm Report has presented as a special guest Bill Lashmet, bargaining coordinator for the National Farmers Organization, and Gene Potter, director of the NFO Meat Commodity Department. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is a gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers.